ืมไฮเดียนะโอล่าโอล่าบ๊วยนัสตาร์เดสบ๊วยนัสตาร์เดสโอ้ดิสิสกูดเซสเวอร์ไลฟ์ออนยูทูบนาวอาร์วียี่สิบสี่ที่เซสอัพในขอนของไมค์สกรีนเรเชลดูคุณฟอร์มเราไม่สามารถได้ยินคุณ It says that on my screen too. Yeah. Yep, mine as well, Rachel. So claps. Rachel, Rachel, Rachel Moylan, yay! Okay, are you inviting them all in? You look very serious. We can't hear you, Rachel. I tested the link, and we're on YouTube, so. Okay, we are all set. We are streaming. Julie and I have it figured out. So, okay, are you inviting them in? Yes. Welcome, students. Thank you so much for joining. We apologize for apologize for being a bit late. Oh, I hear myself. <laughs> Can someone please? <laughs> Rachel should should mute her uh, YouTube. I think. Yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. Um, dear all, welcome back. Uh, Thursday, end of week thirteen. Yes, almost there. Let's keep it a smile. Um, okay. Without further ado, we have a couple of uh, new people on board. I think some of you know them. Uh, so, but nevertheless, can I kindly just ask, um, I'll call your name and can you just introduce yourself? Where are you from? So that the students know you because we have a couple of new people. And then I'll quickly just go through what was the intention of Design Chevette. And with no further ado, we'll go for the first team. So Hilary, you're the first on my screen. Hi, I think you may have seen me last week. Um, I'm Hilary Sale. I'm the interim dean for the University Library. Thank you, Cameron. Good afternoon. I'm Cameron Campbell, senior associate dean, and I'm also associate professor in the Department of Architecture. Thank you, Jim. Hello, I'm Jim Oliver. I direct the Student Innovation Center, and I'm a faculty member in the College of Engineering. Thank you, Judy. Hi, everybody. I'm Judy Isles. I'm with the Iowa State Papa John's Center for Entrepreneurship. Thank you, Evren. Hello, everyone. I'm Evren Baran. I'm an associate professor in the School of Education. Thank you, Luis. Hi, I'm Luis Rico Gutierrez. I'm the dean in the Dean Charette. Uh, and I moonlight working for Cameron as Dean of the College of Design. <laughs> I'm also a, a professor of architecture. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Hi, I'm Jane Rongerud. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Community and Regional Planning, which is in the College of Design. Thank you, Diana. Hello, my name is Diana Sloan. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a program director in the Office of the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Thank you. And in the middle of my screen, hi, dear Seda. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Seda Mikilgin. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Programs in the College of Design and Professor of Industrial Design. Thank you. And then all of you on call, thank you so much for being here. We're very, very happy to have you here. Okay, because this is being live stream, I just need to very quickly go through uh, what is the purpose of the charrette and just to frame it before we even start our, so let me see if I can pull we start our presentations, if that's okay for you. I would kindly ask, I don't know, if we mute people, Rachel. Okay, so welcome to Innovate at Iowa State. This is the week, a big week for Iowa State University where we actually have a big Ignite Innovation Showcase. Today is day seven of a long enduring week. And now we're together here for the College of Design Day on Civic Innovation. We started our charrettes on day one last Friday and at the request of 
many uh, units around the campus, we did this not just as a design charrette, but actually as ISU charrette endorsed by our Dean Luis Rico Gutierrez. And what we would like to invite you is, even if you didn't have any chance to peruse or have a look at the events that we put together for you this week, you can go on the website and actually watch everything via YouTube or links. Um, Dean Louise, would you like to just say a couple of words about the charrette charge? I have the questions after, but if you want to say a couple of words, just to explain to our viewers who weren't with us on Friday and Saturday. I'll just say a couple of things. First of all, uh, the, the overall idea here is that we believe in the College of Design that uh, the big complex problems that we face um, as uh, humans can only be approached uh, through a deliberate balance between poetic and pragmatic forms of practice. So the idea of having students with multiple backgrounds, multiple disciplines is in our mind, the only way of proposing uh, viable solutions for the future. Uh, if a solution is uh, maybe perfect on the technical side, but does not connect with the dreams and aspirations of people, it is most likely you know, destined to fail and the opposite is also true. So it's, it is only through collaboration, through uh, uh, participation in events like this that we can actually move forward. The um, theme for the charrette this, this year is very related to uh, what's been happening over the past um, uh, 12 months. And basically is to, based on what we've learned of, uh, um, um, as students and professors, uh, um, after this huge experiment of moving all of our curricula everywhere in the world <laughs> to at every level to online for 12 months, uh, the question is, I will put it this way, is simple is what should we keep? What can we keep? What can actually help us, you know, improve the pedagogical system that we had before? So that's why it's called the future of design education. Thank you, Luis. Thank you very much. Just for um, guiding those of you, we had a select group of people working with our students from that different units at the university. And, and we had you, all of you students. So you're the main actors of this story. And we want to say thank you because you've been super, super trooper in doing this on top of your academic work. So thank you for being here. Um, there were some things that were students were prompt with um, question of belonging, resistance, continuity, transformation. You're gonna see some of these terms uh, erupt from their presentations. And throughout the charrette, our students had to do three exercises. The first one um, to answer this question, sorry, how might we reframe learning spaces, places and practices in all our college communities in a post pandemic era? And we ask our students to investigate, to co-create, and locate those places so that we can have a collective well being and teaching and learning. So we ask them to create and implement a something for learning. So you will see a big span of proposals. We have final five teams. Some of them is a product, some of them is a platform, others are systems, other are policies. So the range of proposals in front of you will be very diverse, but that's one of the aims of the charrette. And also there's a, a big uh, emphasis on the conceptual framework. So it's not as a, a polished outcome artifact with high fidelity, but it's actually a conceptual framework so that all of us who are part of the judge panel, we can actually push this work further and actually put it forward at the university level. Okay, without further ado, they had to review some of the visions of their colleges and build up some maps. So that was one of the tasks that we asked in the beginning. So investigating. The second task that we asked of them um, was to reframe and redefine what are our learning practices at university level. So what are the pra learning practices in higher education, be it in the College of Design or their own colleges. And the last exercise that we asked of them was with the knowledge of all the activities that we did throughout the weekend, if they could create a learning experience for the future. That was the ultimate um, design brief for all five teams. They will have many 
perspective and we're quite happy to see the results. So without further ado, I'm going to leave this, stop sharing. And I think Rachel will pull the first presentation. Rachel, do you want to quickly go through the logistics? Uh, sure. Each team can actually present for themselves so that they can move through the slide order. Um, so team one, if you want to go, or actually team four, team four, excuse me, if you want to go ahead and prepare right now, you should have the ability to share your screen. Um, I will put in the chat, you do have 15 minutes to go through. I'll put in the chat a countdown um, as you're getting close to time. And then the judges, you'll have five minutes to review and critique before we move on to the next one. So with all that, team four, I see your screen. It looks perfect. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so our team is team four. Uh, it's me, Sayyutta Chatterjee, Michael Tomlinson, Luke McDonnell, and Abraham Polonia. And uh, our prompt uh, starts with this one question that do you ever feel that it takes you a lot of effort to get back into the right headspace or plug yourself back in to the online atmosphere that we all are facing these days? If your answer is yes, brace yourselves and see our presentation. During our shirt, we um, often, a lot, a lot of the team members, apart from ourselves, while even listening to other team members, we realized that mental health issues have been a concern in the College of Design even before the COVID era began. And obviously this has been exacerbated during the pandemic. So our vision statement had to, has to deal with uh, this prompt is that how do we address mental health before jumping into creating future learning spaces for people? And in order to create a healthy, sustainable, inclusive and safe learning environment, we've decided to address this specific part called learning health. I'm gonna explain that in the next slide. But to, to facilitate this, we need both physical and virtual hybrid spaces that can create engaging learning experiences. The few questions that we were trying to answer through our project is, are these, that how do you process what you're learning? How do you um, embrace the chaos and compose yourself during this online platform and uh, the burnout of being online all the time? And how do you get into the right headspace to learn? Um, and we'll give the credit to Mr. Cameron, uh, Professor Cameron Campbell to give us this beautiful world, uh, word called Headspace. So learning health. Uh, we often talk about mental health and physical health, but we don't quite describe learning health. It's, this, it's about mental learning as well, and it's in this Venn diagram of where physical and mental health meet together because we're using all the five senses of our body and our limbs to be able to engage and learn um, according to the matter of the subject. So where we may willingly take part in shared struggles and challenges to gain something that will improve the quality of our life and mind. And it cannot be categorized easily under physical or mental health. <clears throat> Therefore, we have to make it efficient and enjoyable in terms of you know, reaching across all masses and improve our learning health for all the people, not only at the College of Design, but also at ISU. And uh, Michael is gonna present to you the ideation process. Yeah, so from um, gathering the like kind of mission and what we wanted to accomplish and uh, focus on, we went to into ideation and started mapping things that we needed to change and what was working in the present day. Um, and then we kind of came to a conclusion that additional space for people to where they can chill and hang out and uh, be able to exit that reality of constant stress or schoolwork or um, just the today's day and age of COVID. Um, so we started um, mapping different ideas in there and where like these places could be. Um, and then we also were like, well, you know, for future um, pandemics that will happen, um, what can we do in those times where we are away from people again? How can we constantly keep people together? So we thought of a VR setting to explore the ISU campus and um, keep those people engaged with each other um, that we are not doing right now and now we're con uh, disconnected. So then after going through those, we went and we were continuing to think about it and we decided, okay, we wanna circle back and how can we rethink what we were trying to get at? So we looked at the pods and the spill chases, uh, the chill spaces and how we can plug those in and give people some ideas and reminders um, and focus on that existing infrastructure that we have now instead of building brand new or thinking way outside the box. If you want to go next. Um, and so then we started to really um, dive into those plugins and how we could 
um, set those out and be different from what's already there. So we, we thought about soundscapes and how people can listen to, so podcasts, um, different things that, um, like headphones and like where people can listen to uh, people like lectures for uh, teachers or just sounds that make them calm. Um, then we went into how, what kind of aud audiences would we, you know, gather. So the faculty, the student, the students, and uh, the support staffs that we have on campus. Um, so we just started to ideate different sections that we could focus on in the VR um, or app setting that we were thinking, as long as uh, also with those physical spaces that we could have. So how do we help people um, mentally and like how, how do we get them to feel safe and that we are there with people and that they're not the only ones in today's society. So moving forward, um, we decided that if we have to find something that gets into our right headspace or helps people get into the right headspace, we have to do it both physically and virtually. And that's where we circle back to just creating physical uh, seclusion spaces or places for solitude, which we're calling pods, um, to also engaging with the hybrid environment. And we kind of came up with a very basic mission statement at the time, uh, where we try to answer this uh, question again. And we say, basically we need safe and stress-free virtual and physical spaces to belong, to familiarize with, and to unlearn. And this word unlearn came from, directly from Jordan Brooks's speech uh, during the weekend. Um, and we also need an egalitarian space where we forget the role of the student and professor and the administrator, and we all become peers and fellows and friends in just, you know, simple social settings because we're all social animals. Um, and on the, on the more active side, we're actually trying to address the issue of mental health uh, due to burnout because of too much online screen space. The Dean in his uh, speech also mentioned that in the intersection of interaction and technology, one of the challenging parts was the experiential part of learning. And therefore we wanted to take up this challenge and say, how can we use all five senses or how can we design something to please all five senses for students? So here we team, uh, team four presents to you plugin, which is a toolkit that allows people to help find the right headspace before and after screen-based screen learning. The toolkit has multiple tools at our disposal to engage with and improve the process of experiencing a hybrid learning model. And obviously some of these pictures are, uh, some of you already seen this on the weekend when we presented, but you'll, it'll make more sense uh, as we try to move forward with uh, the different aspects that we're introducing in the toolkit. Michael. So go, we wanted to ideate and make some iterations of what we were thinking for these physical pod settings. Um, so we, on the left-hand side of the screen would be some precedents that we found during our research. And um, so some of them were in New York City where people could just sit and relax and, you know, be in public, but have their own private space at the same time. And then as well as Columbia University, this is just a location where students can hang out, um, play games, interact with each other, and be in that physical setting, gaining that, um, that connection with students. So then we went into uh, some sketches that we created and one was um, just an area where people could sit and then I have a table where they can, you know, play cards or do homework at and then some plants to really gather that nature feeling and um, just that Zen um, location. So then we went into an actual 3D iteration of kind of getting that that little sketch and it's a very rough um, iteration, but it's just kind of an idea of where these would be people would be sitting in and being able to interact um, with that location. So then moving into all the way to the right, this is a possible location where it'd be set up, would be in that like atrium area in the college of design, just so people can see that the space is there as well as interact um, with the location that they're going to be in, as well as if they are, if they have some time between classes and they just kind of want to relax and get away from that stressful time and listening um, to different students and stuff, they can step in this location and take a breather. So in these locations, um, they would be focused on soft carpet, sensory material um, for like the bench tops, um, recycled wood for building these locations, TV so people can just relax, water, um, pictures, plants, storage, whiteboards so if they're doing homework in there and the air fresheners, that way it would just, you know, they have that constant relief uh, feeling. And then utility is these pods provide a physical space for seclusion from the busy and stressful environment of the building, 
One can sit and relax in the pod in an intimate and cozy setting. Uh, this space is semi-private in nature and allows one to experience solitude. Aroma mist and entertaining books and charging outlets will also be available in these locations. So it's just primarily an area where students can step out of reality and spend time with them themselves as well as just a, a friend if they want to bring them in. All right, moving to the physical, uh, from the physical to the virtual platform, we designed an app. And uh, this is just a very basic minimum viable product wireframe of this app, where we see uh, features like tune in, which talks about those sound bites, where we can uh, all discuss our musings as we go on with just simple audio files instead of too much visual overload that we're having with these online classes. Uh, strategies to cope up, and the idea is to get help from the different experts in the field to develop uh, this aspect of the app. And um, scavenger hunt, uh, thanks to Anna and Jane, uh, this idea we developed with uh, making sure that we're, we're able to connect beyond the screen space uh, into the nature. And Raven Ranch session, it's kind of like an anonymous way to connect with each other. And uh, I'll talk about a little bit more and then time management and settings. Um, so I have taken the persona of uh, Professor Ron Giroud and Professor Campbell to explain to you what TuneIn would be. In TuneIn, you have different passions, like for example, arts and crafts, gardening, photography. So let's take for example, Professor Campbell who has photography, he would have uploaded different uh, episodes. And one of them would look something like this where he's talking about his experiences photo doing photography in New York. And there'll be a small bio. So I can choose to skip, I can choose to uh, see the different uh, episodes he has, or I could choose like any of these options. Same thing with uh, Professor Ranjuru, like she did discuss that she likes baking and she does this activity with her daughter. So I just mentioned that in the bio and we can just, you know, hop onto any of these episodes and just listen to her doing her thing. And when we're doing this, what's important is to notice that we're not just thinking of the professor in terms of a teacher. We're looking at them as a human being who has other interests just like us. Moving forward, Cope Up will have strategies like, you know, playing nature sounds, doing a 10 minute guided meditation or desk exercises, uh, exercise to relax your eye muscles, having some kind of home spa ideas and uh, comfort food recipes. And again, this will, uh, this part, because we're not experts in designing this, we will need help from experts and do some research to design this part. There will also be the feature of an SOS call. So instead, in, in any case, when someone is feeling extremely overwhelmed, they can have four or five close contacts from our ISU community uh, in, in their contact list that this SOS call will be in touch with. And the moment they press this button, all these people will be getting like a text message or some kind of an intimation that um, this friend of ours is in need and we should probably uh, get some time to talk to them. The scavenger hunt part will have uh, a map showing different locations. And let us say, for example, we choose out of all of these options, we choose sculpture walk. So it'll tell us exactly the first clue and where to start, and then we can go from there. You will also have an option to share, and you can start sharing with your friends and create actually a group activity uh, where everyone can find different clues and uh, get together, leave little hand notes and messages uh, so we can collect, we can go back to those more um, primitive but more enjoyable forms of connecting with each other socially. In the rant session, the idea is that the moment you enter the rant cave, your profile becomes anonymous. So here, no one finds out who you are, what, uh, you know, what, what your major is, nothing like that. And your identity is absolutely hidden, it's codified, uh, and you can enjoy ranting about anything you like. So the examples could be having writer's block or very hectic uh, you know, decisions to take, having burnout. So I chose the example of burnout where A53R1, which is an encrypted name, um, says you know, it's been a tough couple of months for them during the COVID, uh, they've got COVID in infection and they also have to constantly work and produce and teach classes. Um, and, the, and the fun idea here is to use uh, bird sounds, for example, quack, uh, quack, quack, wherever there's any kind of swear words or bad words. So that way it doesn't become too triggering. And in case it is, I mean, you can just skip to the next episode and you can play, pause, um, rewind forward. In the manage part, the, it's a very simple uh, part of this app, which reminds us that we also have to study and keep on track with our syllabus, otherwise we're gonna fail <laughs> or not com complete our goals. So uh, you can create a task list 
which will give you constant reminders that have you finished these five tasks that you set up for yourself today. And uh, you can sync it to the Google, Cal Google Calendar, Canvas Calendar, and the MySpace app, given that you already have those three installed in your um, phone. The settings is the, this is one of the most novel and innovative ideas of this app is that most settings are all about profiles and safety, but this settings part is about enabling multiple notifications to make you take breaks, to make you feel happy and hopefully make you feel happy um, and succeed you to get into the right headspace and plug back in to um, the online platform, the hybrid, hybrid platform. So you can create your profile, you can enable a joke of the day, desk exercises, uh, remind yourself to take breaks, have a family call reminder or call a friend. Also hydration, um, to remember to drink enough water. And you can also edit your SOS contacts as I explained before in this section. And this is our last and final page where you can just see how these reminders would just pop up. You know, For example, you have a joke of the day. Uh, you know, What do you call a fish wearing a bow tie? Sophisticated. Uh, and then you have your desk exercise reminder. Uh, and you can choose to snooze them because it is important to do these tasks uh, or you can say done once you're done. So these are some of these examples that we're just showing. And once you do finish something, it'll give you a congratulations message making you feel some kind of uh, some kind of sort of affirmation and validation that you did something great today because we don't see each other often these days and we don't have people telling us excellent or good job or congratulations. So the app will do it for you. And that's it, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, please ask questions. Okay, we already have some questions on the chat and because we have lots of judges, I would kindly ask if you have a, a specific clarifying question if we can put it in the chat so that then they can address it. Um, if anyone would like to make a comment now or have some sort of uh, feedback that it's immediate or a clarifying question, please go on. Seda, do you mind if I start with you and you have that question, how does the app interact with the new physical environment? Of course, please, thank you. Sunny or Michael? Yeah, um, so how does the app interact with the new physical environment? I think the scavenger hunt part of it is about collecting a group of people and saying, well, I'm gonna take the Campanile Kiss scavenger hunt um, would you like to join me? And the idea is that we do this absolutely socially distance apart, but we're engaging with the physical infrastructure that the campus already provides us. So that's one part of it. The other part is um, the reason we're not having physical and virtual uh, sort of intermingle too well is one, I mean, this is all minimum viable product. Uh, we've only had a week to really churn out a lot of this concept, but to deal with the physical space, we already have the pods. So we don't, we don't wanna take away um, from the virtual aspect of it. And we are all hooked to our phones, especially students, not so much professors. And the phone is something we do, we're, gonna, we're gonna die without basically. So having reminders, having a balanced um, you know, checkup happening on your phone is a great way. Another great way to, to use the app is that you can sync it to your laptop if you wanted to. And the same reminders would pop up while you're working. I hope that answers the question. Yes, um, so there's more. Oh, there's comments. Uh, a question from Evren. Um, we talked about the potential increase in cognitive load with tech use. How would you address that in your design? And we don't have a lot of time, so I will- We will, um, we will have quack quack sounds and we will have uh, congratulatory messages. We will get to know the human aspect and the friendly aspect of our very strict professors. And most importantly, we'll have incentives like, uh, you know, getting aromatherapy candles or some kind of little prizes upon finishing your task lists. Let us say you finish your task list in the week, then you can get some little prizes from the College of Design or little congratula congr congratulatory notes from your professors or teachers. Okay. Louise, would you like to offer any comment? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. We talked a great deal about the app, so and and I, I, I really like it. But I want to go back to the physical one, the physical space, um, and maybe talk a little bit about comparison between the two. So there was an emphasis on the physical space about seclusion and being able to disconnect, silence, uh, being uh, uh, being apart. Is it the location that is right in the middle, in the busiest area in the college? the right one. I mean, is the other side, for example, of the building a, a, a better one? 
uh, is is somewhere else. I mean, some of the landings a, a better um, a better place. So I'm I'm curious about the choosing the location. I know that it's accessible to everybody, but on the other hand, does it make it more difficult to be able to disconnect? Yeah. So. Um... We, we chose this location to start off with. This would be a study that we would conduct um, just to see how many students actually utilize that location if they think it is too busy for them. Um, and if it is, then we would try other locations in the building. So we would try on the other side and see how many people utilize that section. And if it's just, a, if it's getting more flow in a different location because it is more secluded and it is a secluded kind of atmosphere, then we would look at those findings and be able to you know, judge, okay, this needs to be in this location because it didn't work in the main atrium. So that would be a kind of a, con uh, a conclusion of you know, the research that we conduct with this location. Perfect. And just to finish very quickly, it feels like the app is, um, is a way of connecting. I mean, there's a lot of um, prompts and ways for the app to congratulate students and connect with each other. So in a way, I actually think that they're complementary. I'm actually not sure if they are the same, you know, like two versions of the same. So I think, you know, there, there's probably a way of thinking about them as being complementary and not just, not trying to do the same thing. Let's just put it that way. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Sunny. Thank you, Michael, for representing your team. Well done. There's more comments on the chat. So have a look at them. We'll save the chat and I'm gathering all the feedback and all um, more want to come online just to get some feedback on your thoughts. Um, I'll I'll be ready for you. Okay, Are great job. On? Really important project. Rachel, is it? Yes, team two. Um, you are ready and able to share your screen. Okay. Wonderful. That looks great. I can see it fully and I will um, keep time in the chat for you. Awesome. Okay, so this is our proposal, ISU Energy Hubs, and we are team two. Um, Brenna, who unfortunately couldn't make it, is a fourth year architecture student. Me, I'm Bryce Ketterhagen. I'm a second year landscape architecture student and... Hi, uh, I'm Eric and I'm currently a Master of Industrial Design student. And I'm Sarah Ng. I am a first year student in industrial engineering. Yeah, so first starting out, even before we, we looked into the exercises, it was interesting to see that there was different perspectives, different age ranges and how um, we could also build on each other's experiences in college and um, how Sarah was not a part of the College of Design per se, uh, as much as of, of the three of us. And it was interesting to get her perspective on each of these situations as well, making it more interdisciplinary, I guess. Um, so some of the questions we wanted to ask were at the top here for exercise one, who are our learners? Ask powerful questions, questions to find a journey, why design and force of courage and collaboration. And so we started talking about COVID and how it's really affected us both physically and virtually. Um, and we kind of branched off of that, trying to get positives and negatives. Um, it was kind of difficult to come up with positives. There's a, a whole lot of negatives going on. Um, just not real great uh, situation right now. Um, but one of the things that we really, really wanted to focus on was chaos and how we can create good chaos. And it doesn't seem like we have that with COVID, uh, both in the physical and virtual element. Um, when we're in front of the screen, it just feels awkward and um, feels forced almost. So we really wanted to get back into the chaos of, um, you know, when we would present to people in the College of Design and uh, just interacting and connecting with people and stuff like that. So that's basically where we thought of going from exercise one to exercise two. So again, with the questions, we, we thought, okay, um, now that we have a um, general idea of what we're gonna do here, uh, we wanna frame a question that we wanna answer with either a place, a thing, uh, something that we implement into the system. Um, so we just brainstormed questions and each one kind of flowed to the next one, uh, really started with chaos, is it good chaos? Um, how do we create good chaos? 
connections? How do we uh, create connections again, especially with the online environment? Can we do that physically and virtually? Is there a way to combine them? Um, but basically what we came up with, uh, the general outline of this was how do we re-energize the student population? Because it seems like everyone is just um, not into it. It just feels dead and we want to get that energy back and up and going again. So um, first initial thoughts were, can we do it through a person, uh, peers, professors, uh, professionals, family? Um, can we do it through a space? Can we do it through a physical space? And what does that look like? Do we re redesign a space, either an outdoor space, so like a classroom, or maybe within the dorms or campus buildings? Um, one thing that we love in the College of Design is the studio environment where you can uh, have your own desk and just like really individualize it. Um, but you don't get that at other colleges. Can we implement the studio space into other colleges and how does that look? How does that work? Yeah, so as we focus more on redesigning spaces, we looked into adaptable, adaptable spaces, as well as what would be the funding for these spaces and what resources are already in place that we can utilize. So for adaptable spaces, we really looked into personalizing space, like Bryce said, with the studios. I know the College of Engineering doesn't really have anything sort of like that. And it would be really interesting to see how we could individualize spaces within other colleges as well, um, as well as those studio spaces. And for the funding spaces and resources, we were thinking about what buildings would we want to implement possible ideas in, how collaboration between disciplines would work and what it would look like, and what kind of shared resources could we use throughout each college. We also looked into nature and times for slowing down. So when we really thought about it, we always notice students outside when the weather is nice, either studying or just sitting and taking in all the fresh air and just experiencing the outside because it's a break from being inside with all the classes, especially when you're in front of a screen all the time. So we were thinking about what people prefer and what sort of outdoor learning and study spaces there are and why students are using them. So we noticed that most students like the secluded areas where they can be outside in the open while also staying in their own personal bubble and doing what they usually need to do. As for times for slowing down, we noticed that most students have about 15 to 20 minutes in between class, which is really helpful when you need to talk to a student or professor and take that time to really slow down throughout your day. When we talked about budgeting downtime, we also talked about um, not wasting time, as well as that unhealthy go, go, go mentality. And sometimes you just need to take a step back and just breathe and relax before continuing throughout your day. And this would also help prevent burnout. We also discussed a week where professors would go and lighten the load, sort of like a prep week, but an actual prep week with no homework, um, because we didn't really have this this semester. And it would be integrated into the in syllabus for each class as well as a mental awareness week, because we believe that would be really beneficial. So our focus, we ended up with eight sort of focus areas. Um, we decided on inclusivity, ease of access, ownership, adaptability, re-energizing space, realizing that learning isn't pulling all nighters. It's about actually learning the material, slowing down and taking time to breathe in your surroundings and flipping between modes. So next we mapped out how energy is and could be generated on campus. And here's a mind map illustrating that. And in the next slides, I'll zoom in to some of the branches so that you can see better. Next slide. Um, one aspect we looked at was the physical space. So we considered some things that we enjoyed during this semester and this last year, um, such as we mentioned, outdoor classes, getting more into nature and finding times to slow down. Next slide. And, okay. Uh, we also wanted to acknowledge the importance of the times between activities uh, that we now miss. So those breaks that you get when you walk between classes or activities and thinking how we could include more intentional breaks and time to slow down in our schedule. Next. And we also wanted to consider how do we allow for spontaneous breaks? So not having, oh wait, yep, uh, not having everything so rigid so that we can adapt to stress. And when burnout does arise or things like that, uh, we can have, 
we can have a space to reflect and um, think about this adaptability and positive chaos. And we also considered if there would be a virtual way to intervene and provide spontaneous interactions or breaks from the scheduled activities or routine that aren't allowed, uh, aren't allowing us to have that in between time that we need. Okay, so our possible routes of interest after that time of ideation of looking into um, where to go next from um, the start was can we do an outdoor classroom? It's a dynamic space for learning and outdoor interaction. It really allows us to uh, enjoy uh, what the outdoor environment has to offer. And then this can be like reserved um, for by professors if they want to, instead of using their space that they have on the syllabus, they can say, um, we're actually gonna meet here today. And so have that classroom area um, just to allow for this little bit of a break, a little bit of green and um, stuff like that. Um, but then we also thought about an energy hub. Uh, is there a place to exchange energy ideas, learning? Um, inspirational work is pinned up on the walls. There's flexible seating and activities. And also it's like a time for relaxation. There's places where you can just sit and enjoy and not have to worry about school. Uh, really just a step away from the chaos that always goes on around us. And then finally, could we implement a policy, um, either added time between classes to allow for students to rest, walk, talk to professors and enjoy their day, just like more time, whether it be 10, 15 minutes. Um, sometimes 10 minutes feels like it's not enough time and we can't walk um, fast enough and we can't catch that break that we so desperately need, uh, especially in times of uh, the go, go, go. And so finally, we um, going from that, we jumped into this idea of having energy, uh, energy hubs. We, we named them energy portals. So it's a series of spaces implemented across the campus to enhance interdisciplinary and collaborative focus through technological means. And so this um, would include uh, spaces across the campus. Um, for each college, there'd be one implemented and then it would encompass uh, all the students from that college. Um, so basically we're looking at uh, flexible seating, adaptable structures for working, a large projector and smaller screens for Zoom interactions. Uh, so communication between the hubs is gonna be crucial. Uh, and then also spaces to pin up work and create informal critiques. So there will also be um, student work to energize us, but also, um, just things to uh, and sit and enjoy while we're in this hub. And these are the colleges across the campus. You can see that there, we'd have one located centrally for each one, and then uh, have that be a space where students can enjoy and um, really connect with other colleges, but also just take a break in that space. Also connecting from home, uh, we know that uh, things have been changing a lot with virtual um, interactions and can we make that a good thing? Um, and we think that we can make something where you can be at home and then also connect to the energy hub if you have a question, if you want to uh, tune into class, that kind of thing. So really having it be uh, an adaptable space, really a dynamic space for people to enjoy, but also study and have it very studious. So it's going to have a social aspect to it, uh, students to students um, within the college, but then a, across the university, uh, and then students to faculty and faculty to faculty. And basically, this is going to be right here is a really like a good ideation of that, um, what one of these uh, hubs would look like, uh, just flexible seating, um, like a screen over here. And this isn't like the model one. We also wanted to include uh, the fact that these spaces will be implemented based on the preference. And so the college of design will be a lot more chaotic and have a lot more work pinned up on the walls than the engineering one, which will probably look more orderly and have that be um, more of the focus on that. So we really wanted to be uh, very flexible between the colleges. So we also wanted to consider um, how can we use this to further resources uh, such as guest lectures, 
uh, from those located outside of AIM so that they can lead discussions and different interactions even after we go back to in-person classes um, and industry. So how could we further connect and discuss with industry? Um, industry could come to this space potentially virtually and offer feedback on student work or offer other information uh, or workshops. And what if we considered learning in the other direction too? So could they come to receive feedback and have discussions on projects they're working on or things um, that they're currently doing? And maybe some of the, um, uh, this would give students opportunity to try and apply some of the concepts they're learning. And yeah, just have more of a discussion. Um, and then also for other universities, when we're collaborating with other universities abroad or international, internationally, um, how can we facilitate that connection uh, in a different way so that when you do see this person or this team that you're working with um, and they're full, uh, full scale on the wall and things like that, like you could almost shake their hand. Um, how does that change the dynamic as you work along each other, alongside each other throughout the semester um, and feel like you're in the, almost in the same room? So these energy portals would basically just be a series of spaces that would be implemented across campus to encourage interdisciplinary and collaboration. These would work because they would re-energize students. By talking to students from other colleges, you get different perspectives. You really get to get those creative juices flowing so it enhances creativity and you learn from other people. Like I have learned so much being in the charrette with other students of the College of Design because I never had the opportunity to talk to students in the College of Design before. And it was amazing to see how different perspectives really helped shape my perspective, especially with all the things that I'm learning and doing. So we really believe that these portals will be a solution to re-energize students, especially in the time of COVID or really just connections in general. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I believe Anna might have had some connection issues. So if you would like to, if our judges would like to give their comments or ask their questions, um, please unmute yourself and do so. We have five minutes. Luis or Cameron, would you like to start us off? Sure. Um, well, I was excited about the, um, you know, first, I think the, there's a lot of richness in the data gathering part. And I don't know, it's kind of hard to see, of course, all the text and how the, the kind of networks were built. But I think, you know, you really were kind of studying the different uh, phases of it. The, the, um, the energy hub itself, like the way we interact, uh, I thought that 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 idea is really strong and and connecting it somehow to this idea of an energy week, which uh, we hadn't, I hadn't heard that, or maybe I did, but I thought that was kind of an exciting moment of, of pause that isn't about just going on a vacation to spring break in, you know, Fiji or something, but rather about re-energizing what that, per, what that, what a spring break typically or any sort of break should be about is like, how do you do that? And what are the inputs? And the fact that it could happen in your home and in these other places and that we could engage others. I think that's what's really strong about this project. So thank you. Uh, Judy, I actually, go ahead. And I was saying that Judy put a few comments on, on the chat. Would mm -hmm. you like to make some comments out loud so that we can hear your voice? You're muted. We cannot hear you. <laughs> I was muted on my headset. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Um, no, I, you you talk about it being interdisciplinary, but you also talked about each each college's hub looking very like the college, orderly for engineering, chaos for design. So, how do you make sure that that's an inter interdisciplinary inclusive environment? Or is that the idea is that the design people come in and see that engineering is more orderly and that's okay too. So just, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you design that. Yeah, it's a good question. We really wanted to make it personal. I think that was the biggest thing was um, the college of design just feels personal. And there are a lot of other colleges that don't have that same interaction within the environment. And so, um, 
these spaces would kind of display like the general outline of um, what students like about the space and the students could make it their own. They could be uh, input for each college is um, taking input from the students and then making it from that, like designers making the space from their input, uh, really just personalizing it was our goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with some of those portals or windows, hopefully some people get some inspiration and be like, I want that. Or like, I want more mess or I want more of this. I know personally for me as well, since I'm in engineering, I do thrive on an, a chaos environment rather than orderly that some people might think. So really like the idea of a pinup board was completely new to me. I had no idea what that, that was. And just the idea of that sounds really interesting and really helpful, especially for huge engineering projects. I've known I, a lot of en engineers who uh, enjoy a chaotic environment, so, <laughs> so it's not necessarily <laughs> discipline specific. Um, I actually think that this is a great project. Uh, I'll just make one uh, recommendation. Um, I think uh, talking about chaos and freeing yourself from the limitations in this world, <laughs> uh, this feels more like Doctor Who's phone booth. Uh, actually, the dimensionality of it <laughs> is completely relative. <laughs> I mean, the fact that you go in to a larger space, uh, you go in actually to a space that is not fragmented, that is actually a single space that is Iowa State space, mm -hmm. but then has this portal that manifests themselves in each of the colleges. I, I think thinking that way, not as a, as a fragments connected, but as a single space that actually is larger inside than outside, actually is, is probably in my, in my mind, it helps me um, uh, imagine it a little bit uh, 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 easier. And that you can actually, because of that lack of dimensionality of this multi-dimensionality that it has, I can actually continue to exponentially connect other modules to it that are not separate, but part of the same. Uh, so I'm, I know that I'm, I'm making it sound um, uh, uh, too complicated and I have to confess, I haven't seen Doctor Who since I was a teenager and that was a lot of series ago, but uh, I, I'm really excited because of this, you know, <laughs> this idea that, you know, dimensionality is overcome <laughs> through the portals is, is for me uh, what is really beautiful, almost poetic about this project, so. <laughs> Jane? Yeah. yeah. I thank you. I like that you saw me. Yeah. Um, so look up. Maybe along the same lines, and I'm speaking as a planner here, but but what strikes me about this project is that it's created an infrastructure that we spent a lot of time talking about interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, ways to connect. And um, I actually think the example of, oh, I didn't know about pinup boards. So I imagine students being able to see spaces that are different, but those might be spaces that they connect to. So I would like to hear from the team just I guess your thoughts on this idea of this as an infrastructure and how you see this infrastructure as facilitating interdisciplinarity specifically or other types of um, collaboration within the campus. It needs to be a short answer, guys. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess in many ways, um, yeah, I mean, because we thought of it also as one option is like, you could almost just ring it up and like whenever you wanted to have a spontaneous interaction, you could. So, I mean, say you were working on a project and you weren't in the college of design, you were in another college and you wanted some feedback on color theory or anything like that. You didn't maybe know about, or maybe you don't even know the question you want to ask. You just want to get another opinion. You could kind of go there and just see who's on kind of thing and get feedback in that way. If that somewhat answers a little bit. Super. Congratulations, team two. Okay, do we have team three lined up? Rachel. Yes, hi, yeah. I'm here. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Let me know if you're able to see it. Yep. Great, perfect. So my name is Rachel Schmitz. The other people in my group were Talia, Ahmed, and Anna Sylvia. So a brief overview of SciCares, it's going to, we essentially started with studying of the pedagogy of care and how we could create a culture of care at Iowa State. So we focused a lot on mental health and well-being. So a general overview before we get started. So currently 80% 80 of students at Iowa State are experiencing a negative impact on their mental health due to COVID. 
Uh, that's a 41% increase over last year, and even that is quite high. And these statistics are pulled from the Student Health Center on campus, and 64% of those students that experience mental health issues drop out of school. That is a very high percentage of people, especially due to COVID. We've seen enrollment drop. We've seen people even lose their lives over uh, the mental health issues from the last year and before that. So that is a very large issue because we obviously don't want to lose the people who we have here at Iowa State, either from just dropping out. So six times, so graduate and professional students are six times more likely to experience anxiety or depression compared to the general adult population. I'm sure, um, we, I know we have a couple of graduate students on here. You guys can all attest that due to the high levels of stress, um, you are more likely to drop out or transfer to other colleges. Um, so just to keep that enrollment rate high, we're also going to enroll this. We found interesting after our conversation with Jane, there is 0% of information about need-based students collected by the university with mental health issues. So those people who either have used food assistance, uh, emergency services, things like that, there's no information about people um, who are maybe more in need based on their mental issues as well. So that is one other focus that we need in our college. A few more facts. Common concerns include stress or anxiety, which is at 91% now of all students on campus that were uh, surveyed. Disappointment or sadness is at 81%. Loneliness or isolation is at 80%. Financial setback is at 48%. And relocation is 56%. That does include international students. Racial and ethnic minorities, especially those identifying as Hispanic or Latinx, report higher levels of emotional distress due to COVID, which we know are currently underrepresented in our college. College and university staff and faculty report significant stress regarding concerns for returning to campus. Um, this also does include students, but I also have personally heard many teachers who have um, currently couldn't come back to campus because of loved ones. And then lastly, students of color are less likely to seek services, experience greater rates of feeling overwhelmed in their first year, and report greater rates of feeling isolated on campus. So here's a quote by Michelle Obama that says, at the root of this dilemma is the way we view mental health. Whether it's an illness that affects your heart, your leg, or your brain, it's still an illness and there should be no distinction. So our question to you and the question that we asked ourselves is how might we create a culture of care within the university? So the main problems that we focused on, quote unquote problem, I don't love that phrase, but we try to use it just to kind of define it. But mental health services, that are on the website, but they're not fully accessible to students. Staff and not faculty does at, do not have access to these facilities. It is just students and faculty. Uh, faculty is only trained in what they, when they request classes, which there are quite a few. I believe there are close to 20, and they all range in 20 to 60 minutes. And a lot of faculty does not have the extra time to have this training to be able to really engage with their students about well being and mental health. And lastly, um, the website exists, but no one really knows about it. I'm a senior. I didn't know about this website until this year, and I know many other students have had the same issue. So there's a few things that we propose. Firstly is a 24-hour app. This would be in a collaboration with an existing app, such as the Iowa State app, uh, which is, I believe, FAO, or the BetterHelp app. We would also propose a required class for all incoming students, faculty, and staff. This would include transfer students and freshmen. And it would also be open to any people who would wish to retake it to regain the knowledge that they may have lost over time. Third is a possible mentor-mentee program, which we will not cover in this presentation. And lastly is creating a well-being council, which is a branch of the other councils of the College of Design, such as the Liaison Council. What are our goals? Communication changing the culture around mental health, nested teaching, mitigating dropouts and other crisis situations, and then setting up a system of care and accommodations. How this will look. So this well-being council or extension of the liaison council will have a representative from every major, just as the councils do currently, staff representation as well as faculty representation, student representation, which currently does not exist, and the best outcome would be students on every single council. However, we know uh, with feasibility issues, this may not work out, but we are proposing for this specific council. This would be involved with the student body and the faculty senate in order to hire issues. 
And this would also utilize training from the mental health services as a requirement. So anyone who joins this council would be required to go through the training that the mental health services currently offer. So a little bit of how this would lurk, look, sorry. The well-being class would be a half semester class. It would be required for the incoming students, staff, and faculty. It would focus on combating stress and managing crises and overall well-being. It would educate about services that are available and accessible on and off campus. Opportunities for care, such as emergency services, food pantries, the design closet, and housing services. We put these forward as we interviewed students and they realized many of these services existed and they did not know it before and it would have helped them in the past, either from dropping out, taking time off of school, or feeling highly stressed. This is a short look at just a very brief syllabus is what the syllabus could possibly look at. Um, a good book would be Pursuing Happiness, a Bedford Spotlight Reader. It's a very short book and easily doable within the half semester. I believe they use it in some classes currently. It would be an evidence-based approach to learning and applying well-being skills and necessities such as stress management, goal setting, motivation, healthy eating and exercise, and healthy relationships. There is more, but for time's sake, I'm going to continue on. Now the next part would be the 24-hour crisis app. This will give you the ability to call or text any hour, weekly health check-ins. It could be its own app or combined with another. Examples would be the TAO or the Better Health Services. Better Health is a currently a paid service. It's quite expensive. So the university can either pair with them to have reduced rates or we could pair with them uh, ideally to have it free for students. So people are actually able to access therapy when they need it. Um, and those also who experience severe depression and anxiety are much less likely to actually seek help. So next would be the ability to connect anyone to services. So it would be accommodations for crises, connection to food pantries, emergency services, shelters, counselors, food assistance, living assistance, the design closet, et cetera. I know I've heard examples of students who are homeless and can't get the help they need, even though they are currently paying for school. A few view, sorry, a few viewpoints of how this would look and who this would be for. So this is for everyone, people who are depressed, anxious, withdrawing, lonely, upset, and everything in between. We have some titles here for people, ap apathetic advisors, fed up faculty, tumultuous teachers, lethargic learners, and sleep deprived staff. This would also include people who don't actually uh, follow those labels, but anyone who just need help or even just wants to know more about the service to help somebody else. So we had some interviews with students and this is some of their highlights. So if more people would have been willing to help, I would have stayed in school. I didn't know there were services to contact for help. This not only would improve my life, but the relationships and my success in school. With a system like this, I would have been able to get the care that I needed. Possibly I would have been able to flourish with access to these services. The main word we focused on was accessibility because that's what a lot of them focused on. Next, uh, talking to faculty. So we wanted to create a knowledge base for teachers who are curious and want to help their students. Adding on to liaison council and the possibility of adding a well-being council. Centered around care and facilitations for health and wellness. Uh, a great quote that we heard was, we are all collectively floundering together. We thought that was pretty nice one to highlight because it's quite true. Um, accommodations for students and uh, this person that we interviewed cared enough to talk about the health services and get the help that they needed. The example she gave was a student she noticed that wasn't showing up to class. She contacted health services and they went to that person's house and they were actually able to get the help they needed. And we also talked to health services. So with the call, they gave us information on how to access the online services. They gave us a website to make an appointment. Are there such opportunities such as presentations? And that's those same class and presentations that range from 20 to 60 minutes. They are also available for events. Just to recap, the reason we're doing this is it's not just to make a fun place on campus. It's something that is very serious and close to all of us. During this time, during COVID and even before then, many of us may have experienced anxiety and depression and feelings of loneliness or isolation. Our people, and we all know of people who've had those issues. So we propose this in order to help mitigate people who are dying, people who desperately need help and people those who wanna help. So thank you guys for listening. Um, here are some of the links that we used. We do have some process work if you're wanting to look at it. And these are the mental health support campus plan currently as of April 20th. Thank you.
Yes, I was going to say the same as Judy. Um, okay, one first question. And Judy, do you want to say it out loud? Yeah, as long as I'm not muted anymore, right? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> so um, one, I love, I love it when students share data. Um, it's compelling and it really makes you think. Um, so kudos on that. But my question is, how do you get all these students to download and use the app? How do you ensure that that's going to happen? Yes, this would be a required part of the syllabus for all incoming students. Um, we could also go forward in the future. Again, this is not high fidelity. We could go through a marketing plan as well. Um, currently, the system that markets these services doesn't work as well. So that is what we propose as part of the syllabus for the class. Also impressive. Rachel, are you sitting in your car doing this? I am. I, was, uh, I got stuck in traffic on my way back from work and I couldn't make it home in time. So I was so, hoping the blurring would work. But Bonus points for, for being very professional in the middle of your car. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Very Thanks. good. I think people at Target probably think I'm weird, but. No. Um, I think it's a great project. I, I uh, you know, the only course we require all students to take is Library 160, but I think requiring exposure to all these resources that we have is really important and it's kind of heartbreaking to hear people say I didn't know this existed because there's so many support resources available to students and faculty and staff as well so it's been a stressful year I hope uh, I mean I think it's a really timely project and you did a great job of presenting it so thank you thank you James anyone else would like to make a comment or ask a question uh, I, I just want to also um, kudos, um, I mean, for addressing what I think some people call now the ignored pandemic. You know, this is something that was happening before has been amplified by this. And I think, you know, we were struggling to find an answer to it. So, so I really um, commend you for this. I think emphasizing the connections to other activities. So the connection to a class or being part of another class that is required for everybody will actually make sure that everybody has access to the um, uh, uh, to the information. Um, uh, this, you know, you, you were very thorough, you know, in, in actually um, exploring all the different resources that students have, but how, how far behind, how many clicks you need to make actually to get to them is, yeah. um, uh, is, is, is actually just a contribution itself. So, so I just wanna, you know, highlight, you know, this is, this is great and it, it was really well presented. So. Yeah, my comment would be on those lines, but it's not so much the app. I like it a lot that your group is intervening at policy level um, <laughs> or suggesting that students have a voice in councils, um, which is a big difference uh, from the European model. There's always one or two students in every council. Um, so I like, I like that you're proposing that almost like a student liaison council for the college. And it went unnoticed, but I want to bring it to the forefront. Well, that's... And my one note is that the well-being council and driven by actually by student is 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 one thing that I really have some uh, I highlighted in my notes. So, yeah. so thank you for putting forward. And I want to bring us to the chat the question that Hillary had: um, How do you make this more inclusive by addressing individuals or cultures that see this? would never put their hands up and speak up. I think that's what you're mentioning, Hillary. but yeah, okay, Rachel. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the whole reason we made it requirement, because this was a big argument for us, was how do we actually make this more inclusive to everyone? Because it is required, everyone who is coming in would have to do this. Even in Iowa, it feels like, um, you may say cultures that you see this issue of stigma, Iowa has a stigma against mental health. Up until a couple of years ago, um, people who had mental health issues were actually told just to kind of suck it up or like maybe you're just not strong enough to deal with that. I know even when I was a freshman in college about six years ago, that is often what I was told. So I see a big culture shift beginning to change even here in Iowa. So it begins with that culture of care that we were talking about in the pedagogy of care. We really want to focus on changing that culture at Iowa State especially because people who come here from other places, they may see it as a stigma, but this is going to normalize that and teach them how to start to interact with their own feelings and may see their own mental health as stigma or may not know how to realize that they may have these issues that they want to address or how to address it in other people. Jane, yeah. I was just, I was thinking that also that 
this is helping raise the question of how we teach and learn, right? And, and the cultures of wellness connected to that. So I appreciate that as well, that, that there's the, this larger question of mental illness or, or mental health, mental well-being, um, but that it, it's fully embedded in the work that we do at the university and recognizing that we learn better um, when we're taking care of ourselves and each other and, and that there's skills involved in that, skills and techniques. And so I think that I wanted to call attention to that connection because I think it's important. I'm going to suggest also that based on the last answer that you, one of the things that is really nice about your um, uh, proposal is that it's multidimensional, where individuals can actually find their place according to their level of comfort. Uh, the idea of normalizing this across cultures is, is an ambitious one. Uh, on the other hand, because I, I'm sure you're right, this is going to be for some cultures and students coming from uh, different parts of the world, for some of them, this will be a really, really remote uh, concept uh, it could be, I mean, the stigma may be bigger of what you actually think and to overcome it in a short period of time may be complicated. So I think what I like about your proposal is that there's multiple ways of being part of it, beginning with the class, but then multiple um, uh, levels of confidentiality, of anonymity, being very public or very private, depending on your level of, uh, level of comfort. Well done. Team three for the question. Uh, and now team one jump with team, team four jump with team one. Rachel, Jonathan, are you ready? Yes. See, yes, we are. Okay, on your marks, get it. Go All right. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Kay, and my teammates are Annika Ketterer, Rachel Shannon, and Harry Smith. Our team is excited to introduce Sai Says. Sai Says is our vision for a robust physical and virtual infrastructure for engaging Iowa State University and its larger community in an ongoing dialogue about mental health and social engagement. All of us who are here today are students of Iowa State, learning at least in some way each day that which we did not know before. We have come here individually to learn and grow collectively, yet we remain the central character of our story. This is me. I'm just one student here on this campus. But the lessons I've learned may be universal. Like many students, I felt Iowa State spoke to both me's, the one I was and the one I wanted to be. Iowa State mediated the ground between hometown comfort and educational evolution. The activities were abundant, the teaching great, and the campus idyllic. But I think I was learning some of the wrong lessons, lessons I believe many of my peers learn also. We look at a vista like Central Campus with the Campanile centered at one end, and it's beautiful. But from here, we can mistakenly understand that our learning makes us singular leaders rising triumphantly in an open field. We think this gives us strength, but it can be damaging to believe ourselves just a landmark rather than part of a larger whole. For what we did not see around us from our limited perspective was the whole composition, one which defined our place, elevated our purpose, tempered our idiosyncrasies, and instilled in us richer value. The inverse of this is also possible that we believe ourselves not to be singularly triumphant, but singularly suffering. We can come to believe that we are the only person drowning in a pool of strong swimmers. Sai says seeks to challenge the status quo by revealing that we all feel like we're drowning sometimes. And then by speaking to one another about our struggles, we can begin to lower our personal barriers, connect, heal, and grow. Sai says is the manifestation of our personal definition of a learning place in today's moment. We were challenged by Dean Luis's question, how might we investigate, co-create, and locate places that can reconnect people, enhancing collective well-being, teaching, and learning? We began with an unfiltered inquiry of the Iowa State University system around us, an inquiry approach not out of malice, but a sincere desire to understand the problems we see around us. After all, it's only by identifying with candor that we can produce a meaningful solution. Our inquiry produced two key insights. The first, that the COVID-19 pandemic has made us more vulnerable with one another. Our new normal needs to combine these pandemic era accommodations, these new lessons with in-person relationships. The second is that we're hurting for a variety of reasons. So our response needs to be one focused on the practical application of care. Practical care means analyzing how we learn best. Harry in our group made the analogy to that of a fish teaching a person to swim. The fish may be the expert, but it needs to understand how the human functions for that person to learn. Here, our key insight is that of empathy. We continue the analogy of a drowning student, one for whom a lifeline, a floaty, could be empathy from a faculty member or student. Empathy recognizing that all situations are the same 
and empathy recognizing that producing a final project isn't success, but that true achievement is actually through the art of practice. It's by struggling, sharing, healing, and evolving that we learn from those who teach us. It became clear to us that the most powerful teachers were our students, our peers, sorry, peers rather, untethered from pedagogy, the students and the faculty around us. At the same time, it was clear that the most powerful tool for empathetic teaching was storytelling. Stories are for the teller and the listener. It's a catharsis and a lesson, a salve and an inspiration. So Sai says enables public presentation of stories, personal, curated, and via live interaction. It forms a sort of real life spontaneous social network. Through this digital platform and physical infrastructure, we see the representation of ideas, not just as art, but as integral to student engagement and health. We need to see ourselves in ourselves and in others. Here's how we do it with two key applications. The first is the physical space itself, our infrastructural intervention on, in, and around buildings. These interventions make what was in become out, which makes apparent that which was concealed, and also can transform buildings into a billboard or an icon, creating space for public engagement on what was previously a static service. In doing so, they augment the public realm with participatory art. We're gonna begin by using the college design as a case study for this. The current building is heavy, solid, and opaque with interior activities concealed from the primary campus. Sai says can begin to perforate this barrier acting as a college specific live barometer for feelings, blue, red, experiences, what you're actually feeling and artwork. In this way, students and faculty can share themselves and see themselves in others through this medium. You can share experiences like, today I failed my exam. I, I just don't know how to respond yet, but I know it hurts. Or random thoughts like, is finding the ISU albino squirrel a wicked problem? This offers a catharsis to the whisperer and to those who experience it, helping all feel less alone about their experiences. This, in this installation is not limited just to one use though, it's, but it's a flexible gallery forming an interactive interdisciplinary publicly accessible display. Using the same case study, we see that students in the College of Design often have to choose between working in the studio on a Saturday or seeing the big game, but now the big game can come to you with live audio transcription and live reactions. Note the little hearts on Brock Purdy. Uh, Sai says can also act as a, uh, sorry, Sai says can also support live broadcasts at Kanchimsky Auditorium or other campus lecture series, both here or abroad, extending access to the surrounding public. Sai says can act as a welcoming billboard for incoming students during special campus events all year round. In this way, the building can be elevated into an ISU icon, one attractive to visit and inspired and it's by ring in its own right. This exterior gallery space can also be part of a larger Sai Says program, one which connects curated art with those unfiltered moments we talked about earlier and combining them into a weekly conversation series, a sort of emotional debrief where conversations about vulnerability and mental health can occur. If something the artist that presenting that week or another student has shared via Sai Says that you've experienced and you find it meaningful, then you can join the human gallery. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a graduate student, a mother, and a veteran studying in engineering and design. The, hum the Human Gallery lets me join in on an interactive interdisciplinary conversation series where I can connect with others. I love coming here each week because it lets me talk about my experience, my struggles, and the art I see up on the walls, all with other people going through life too. Sometimes when I'm feeling shy, I use the other interaction feature, the Whisper Chamber. Hi, I'm Harry. I'm a freshman in the core design program hoping to become an industrial designer. Sometimes we find ourselves feeling isolated and unheard by our collegiate community. Others may hold truths that they are coming to terms with that they want to vocalize and feel understood and validated. This feature of the digital platform allows users to share secrets, experiences, or feelings they prefer not to share themselves but want to be known. These features don't have to be limited just to the College of Design. Sai says is a capable system framework for increasing transparency and engagement across campus. Here at the Student Innovation Center, we demonstrate the flexibility and adaptability of the program to each building's design language. This particular image illustrates Sai says his ability to reveal real-time student experiences with live messaging and in event advertising. Sai says can serve as an aggregation platform, taking information from across campus and making it instantly interactable. Here we're in the, the, uh, inside the Student Innovation Center. Its flexible platform, interdisciplinary nature, and capability to support campus data analytics lends itself to inclusion as part of a course or employed position. 
Just imagine software engineers and psych majors optimizing and learning from student behavior or a graphic design studio takeover of size says galleries all across the campus. Moving further into campus, we reveal a major installation at, at Parks Library, one where we activate the quad in the plaza immediately in front of it, revealing maybe real-time occupancy or acting as a platform for reads of the week or live reservable activities. In each of these applications, we understand the technology exists right now to make this happen. Whether we're using rear projection on transparent building surfaces, applying LED screens for all weather solid surface applications, or simply augmenting and repurposing already installed screens, SIA says is possible. This physical infrastructure we've been talking about is supported by an accessible, robust digital platform, one which augments the virtual and physical gathering of students and faculty with access via the single platform, or the multi-platform rather, SIA says app. SIA says is user interface lets you interact with real time with displays around you, enabling real life social media sharing, it also lets you understand at a glance current and upcoming events around campus. And also these, the ways that those events or just yourself can enrich and engage your mental health and well being. We end back at the College of Design as our case study, representing possibilities across campus, not just a day, but in the night. In this vision, we see a reinvigorated, healthier, more transparent faculty and student experience. We see a built environment which speaks to where we are and who we are, a physical site for gathering mentally physically and socially in the ways that the pandemic prevented us from doing, a place for encouraging vulnerability and communication. Learning in place means learning from our ISU community, a community operating across many different scales, from our peers to classes, to the faculty teaching, to the different years, disciplines, colleges at the university, to the city of Ames and the state of Iowa as a whole. SAI says meets this community with our flexible physical and digital platform for elevating empathy through, through storytelling and engagement. Here's our framework. Let's build on it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Who wants to start? There are some comments already regarding visual slides and your script. So incredibly done. Um, okay. Who would I would like to say one comment to all of you. Can someone redesign Sai? He's so angry. He's incredibly angry. That angry, yeah. and it doesn't match with your empathy of care. He's just like a <sighs> very upset looking bird. Right? Can someone please redesign? My kids are afraid of Sai. Like <laughs> Mickey Mouse? No, Sai. He goes okay, between sorry. baring his teeth and and just having really strong eyebrows. Yes. So okay, I'll shut up. And who has some comments to or questions to put forward? Uh, beautiful presentation. I do have a question. Um, you showed uh, one facade in the College of Design. You're thinking that this could actually have other manifestations. I mean, the building has four, four sides. Uh, there's actually other planes going into the building, et cetera, et cetera. So, so how, how, how do you think this could actually work at a, at a larger scale or in other parts of the building? Yeah, we have some, uh, some ideas about uh, engaging with the, the interior of the uh, like the interior atrium that we have on the inside, lending itself to not just student artwork, but artwork that then is, is digital screens that can have that flexibility. And on the exterior, uh, we, we were thinking about some interesting applications that particularly those, those stare moments have where people who are on the interior uh, could be receiving the uh, information or seeing art just out, out at the side of their eye as they're moving through the interior, um, but also acting maybe even as like blowing pillars, creating more of an icon moment. I would have a question that I know that you know the answer. But, uh, um, who guards the guardians? Who curates those walls? Absolutely. Thank you for that. So uh, the curation itself. So we, we presented multiple different ideas for, for how content is happening. Some of it spontaneous, um, student driven, and some of it curated. Uh, the intention would be that the curated content would be part of this ongoing uh, series of mental health discussions in the human gallery and would be made up of a, of a council of students, faculty members, and, and the public community at large. I have to ask, who's the artist behind your slides? Because I think the university is going to want to steal you for university marketing purposes. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you so much. Is that you, Jonathan? I, I, I put together the, the narrative format and then our sketch noting uh, is done by Annika and a lot of our beautiful renderings are done by myself and uh, Harry. Uh, well done, very, very compelling. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, I appreciate you throwing in the Student Innovation Center there. It's uh, 
Uh, I love the idea of the interactivity of students being able to use the displays that are available, um, whether it's curated or moderated in some ways, probably important. Um, by the way, I have looked into projection mapping on the exterior of the building. Um, mm -hmm. It is possible and it's wicked expensive. So just so you know, <laughs> uh, especially on, uh, on glass surfaces, it'd probably be easier in the, uh, the College of Design. Uh, but we are thinking about, um, I, I've got a wild idea and a potential donor to do projection mapping on the ceiling of the atrium uh, mm -hmm. to make it an augmented reality surface. But I do think it's uh, this idea of, uh, of using the, all of the displays and media that we have, media display technologies to allow students to feel more engaged with their community. And, uh, um, you know, the, the way you presented it in the beginning is I'm, I'm, I'm alone or I'm, I'm meaningful or, or not. And it's, a, it's really well done. So uh, appreciate the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. I, I have a couple of uh, additional comments. Um, I, I find also really beautiful, uh, I used the word poetic before, you know, this um, um, contrast between a whisper uh, that is translated to something that is the size of a building, for example. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. uh, the idea that those two extremes can coexist is, mm -hmm. is for me really interesting, just as a as a, mm -hmm. as a form of expression, you know, is, is, is really interesting. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I will say is I think there's some scales in between. Building on what James uh, Jim was saying, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, the big projection may be not that complicated. <laughs> what mm -hmm. could be uh, also more, uh, could be also interesting and offer a lot of possibilities. What is, what is in between? For example, mm -hmm. the wall leading into our building where right now there is a mural. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of opportunity to do mid scale projection there where, where you can have more interaction one to one between you know the individual that you had in your graph <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and and feedbacks that are coming from uh, multiple places uh, real time one to one i can move and the image can react or things like that i think there's something in the scaling between that could be also interesting so yeah that's a great way to, to introduce the human scale to it so it's not so if we're talking about those interrelationships feeling emphasized not just by seeing the content but by seeing in your in your form and scale that's great thank you and interacting with them yep physically yeah. um and one last question uh, i think we're running uh, close to the time um it's just like student driven uh posts or faculty as well and staff and all 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 of the above yeah i w i was using student at the beginning in in a broader sense of all of us being learned people who learn and people who educate uh, but the intent would be it would be all Okay. I have more questions, but I'll talk to you later. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, Jonathan, I thought that you were going to say when the question was about how the all this was produced, the simple answer for next time is that's how we roll in the College of Design. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we roll in the College of Design. Mm. Exactly. Good job. Narrative okay. first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, team. Thank well you. Done. Okay, uh, then last but not least, team five, are you ready? All right, so we're team five. Uh, my name is Mackenzie Donald. I'm a first year student in the College of Engineering studying chemical engineering. Hi, my name is Parmis and I'm the landscape architecture student. Hi, my name is Kira Trendle, and I am a sophomore majoring in community regional planning as well as environmental studies. So, moving into our presentation, we wanted to talk about this idea of learning reimagined. So, what is that going to look like? One thing that we know is that the pandemic has taught us the importance of forming deeper connections. And going into the future of education, we really want a learning environment that is going to help us foster these connections. So of course, our focus here is upon learning and how learning has been affected by the pandemic, both positively and negatively. Here's where we collectively worked to share our experiences with learning during the pandemic and kind of what values we wanted to focus on moving forward. So through this, we were able to identify 
um, and kind of converse about our unique experiences as students in different years and departments within the university. And one thing that we really thought was interesting was understanding how studio courses versus general education courses adapted to these pandemic conditions um, and gave us much better insight to understanding the conditions of campus-wide students rather than in isolated conditions in just the College of Design or the College of Engineering. And mainly from this, our largest takeaway was that learning is not and should not be limited to the classroom or the traditional education system. So when looking at these major areas um, of our experiences of the pandemic as students, these are some of the larger areas of focus that we were able to identify. So the first one is engagement. So we were looking at increasing the possibility of communicating with other institutes outside of Iowa State, increasing the availability of faculty members, and kind of our understanding and our experiences with recorded lecture versus in-person lecture of the past. And another area that we were looking at was the emotional and physical associations that we had with spaces or our emotional association with people and spaces. So one of the major things that we've noticed was definitely the lack of socialization and the feeling of isolation that we all kind of have become accustomed to through this virtual learning, which has definitely taken a heavy toll on the mental health of students and faculty alike, as well as kind of our physical health and our activity because we're not able to be going out and interacting with other people. So that mental health side, and then also just not being able to be out and moving our bodies as much. So additionally, we wanted to look at the environment. And one of these things, of course, was virtual education and kind of the difference between asynchronous and synchronous courses and how that has affected our, our styles of learning. Additionally, we wanted to look at things like outdoor classrooms, especially with um, College of Design and some of the drawing studios that has been really common when it is nice out, of course, and how, how we can kind of change social spaces um, from the physical to the virtual and kind of adapt to these new situations. And the last major area of interest that we were looking at was the equipment and resources and sources of information that we were having access to. So the access to tools, softwares and resources and sources of information to be able to be successful in our courses and be able to have an educational experience that we enjoy. Another thing we were looking at was suitable furniture within, um, within the classroom space. And then additionally, we wanted to look at kind of how those interactions occur in that area. So moving on, um, when looking at these major areas, we wanted to turn our focus upon the future and how we can adapt to and integrate these positive and negative experiences from this pandemic. So our vision of focus on student and faculty experiences, interdisciplinary collaboration, and the creation of safe spaces. So with this uh, in mind that we need deeper connections and engagement on post-pandemic era, we came up with three main goals, which are very important in the future of our learning environment. The first one is equity, which is an active commitment to fairness in distribution of public services, facilities, and data. For instance, equity can help to uh, mitigate educational poverty. Flexibility, which means uh, the ability to change or be changed easily according to the situation. This could give educators different educational options based on their needs, interests, and abilities. And the last one is uh, caring, which means the process of protecting people and providing uh, what they need. And after a pandemic uh, like COVID, uh, schools uh, will reopen, but the students' mental health will persist. So a school can be a critical part of the solution by helping them reducing their mental health challenges. The combination of these uh, three factors could contribute to resiliency in learning environments. Resiliency means an ability to recover from or adjust it to adversity or change. And with the assist of technology, we can create educational spaces that provide us 
with the essential tools to follow our equity, flexibility, and caring goal. So why resiliency in education is important? Well, in time of adversity, education retain, retain high, high public value and demand and service as a critical hub for information sharing and reaching out to people. A strong education system has the potential to improve quality, inclusive accessibility and safety in education. It could also help to enhance individual and community resilience resulting in increasing quality of learning and improving self-sufficiency and individual confidence. So res resilience education systems contribute to education structure, relationship network, actions, processes, and finally, reduction of people's mental health and increase inclusive growth for people with different backgrounds and cultures. So our proposal is a winter term class. So this class would be the ability, this class is mainly to gain a community and we want it to be student led and also faculty sponsored. So, and we want this class to mainly be sorted by interest. So that way it's not so much about, it's a class full of people from the same college or people in the same uh, year. It's really meant to broaden your connections because we've been missing those from from the pandemic and to allow those new connections to be made and to allow those new uh, things to form. So the overall structure of the class would be two to three faculty members because what we want is not for the faculty members to like run the class per se, but to be involved in the class as well. And we, that's why we want a student leader. So this student leader would be kind of be like the bridge between the faculty and the students, allowing for a discussion between all, all members of the group and having more of a like a round table discussion, allowing everyone to participate and allow everyone to learn from this experience and to build those connections. Now this class would be like a pass fail class. So that way you, you don't have, you don't have to worry about a grade. You don't have to it's mainly to participate, and that's what you would get to pass is by participating, being active in the discussions and everything we would do. Um, the main and each each class would kind of have its own main theme. So that mean, means like some some classes of this section would have one theme, while another one would have a different theme. So that way people can join a class with a theme that they resonate with. So like maybe one theme about, could be about creativity or another about a certain interest that lots of people have. Um, and how this would work is each week we would have a new topic. So that way the whole group could discuss and discuss a topic more in depth about that. And then we would want the whole discussion to be much more round table discussions. So that way everyone that can learn from each other, no one's, it, there's really no true leader of the discussions. It's more so everyone can have a say, everyone can participate and everyone can learn from this and everyone's on the same playing field. Now we would want like in one to two hour time commitment each week about, so because it's during winter break, we know everyone's very busy. We don't want this class to take up like a big time frame. We want it to be so anyone who wants to join could easily join and have the time to do it. Meaning that it, having some sections meet online, some sections meet in person, all depending on whether or not um, the time commitment and the, having everyone get the opportunity to um, participate in the class. So how this will impact learning and campus culture, we, we really want to look, focus on the non-traditional side of learning, right? We want everyone to learn, we want people to learn in a new way, in an experimental way. We want this to build the community around, build the community so that way people can build these connections. They can build a support system uh, and that they become more engaged in each other. They're, they become more engaged in the interests and are more active in their own learning. Uh, we also want this to enhance diversity by getting people from uh, different countries to come in and help. 
um, involving students from across the country, not just necessarily ISU, um, but like students who come from different states rather than just people who are at ISU learning. Um, and we really want to gain different perspectives. So from this, we will want everyone to learn from each other and learn what other people can think and what, how other people think. So that way, going forward, you can get those perspectives and get those uh, support systems. And so what's impeding this idea? So a big question is how do we encourage students to participate? So it, we could easily plug this in classes or like since we want this to be a class, we can uh, get we can have like academic advisors like to talk to their students like when they're signing up for classes a possible winter term and we were also thinking about um and engaging our attractive email and doing and so that way at least getting the idea out to students and so one question about uh, student leaders is it's kind of like student mentors in like some other classes that we have on isu so like there's an application process um most likely like getting a recommendation from faculty so that way they know their faculty that they're working with um, and then how will we get faculty sponsors is mainly just asking a variety of faculty members and giving them like a pitch of what this class could be and what going forward it it will be well the pandemic has forced the adoption of new ways of learning environments since before the pandemic the conventional learning spaces were not responsive to that condition we reimagine uh, these places at, as uh, hybrid learning spaces in the future. They include movable spaces, such as uh, equipping uh, public transportation with uh, Wi-Fi and other means to provide all people with the ability to connect to classrooms, and virtual spaces that can be connected to international study or independent study. Uh, the outcome of the class can be a proposal for presenting to TED Talks or other virtual events and uh, other educational systems, even in the developing countries. And finally, uh, floating classes, uh, which provide students and faculty with diverse range of spaces to support their uh, individual and social activities, such as uh, equipping outdoor spaces with flexible furniture or a group, um, meeting rooms with video conference technology. Yeah, and overall our conclusion is that we want a class to build these connections. We want to, from learning from what, from the pandemic is that we really had lack of connections, even though it was online, we really didn't get a sense of community coming to ISU. And, we want to build that community. We want to build a support system of students. We want to allow students to connect to people, not only just at ISU, but across the world and allowing those connections to flourish. And uh, yeah. Okay. Louise, I see that you're... <laughs> I'm going to make a couple of comments more than anything because, you know, you see Anna, how gentle she is. I know that if I'm late for my next meeting, she's going to hurt me and it's going to be really painful. So I'm going to, <laughs> I need to leave on time in the next five minutes. Um, I find really interesting this notion of the flat classroom, you know, the idea that you actually came with this pedagogical model that puts everybody in an equal playing field and actually we stimulate discussions at that level. I think it's a... Uh, it really mirrors a lot of the conversation that we had at the beginning. Uh, I actually feel also, um, if if you had, this is my question to you, if you had another iteration in, in the process, this creates a pedagogical model that may not fit every conversation or every learning. It may not be the best one for every learning activity in, in the university. So what I'm trying to say is this fits better, certain kinds of conversations, certain kinds of topics, certain kinds of themes uh, 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 for the class. Do you have an idea what, what fits better, you know, your proposal? What kinds of themes or conversations or classes are the ones that are more, appro more appropriate for this kind of uh, format? Yeah, I think one of the things that we really wanted to focus on when we were talking about this was equity, 
and diversity and intersectionality. So a lot of these conversations around um, personal experiences with programs or um, just areas of interest. So like, for example, if we were gonna be talking about something um, within like the planning environment, the urban planning environment, um, being able to bring in different perspectives of somebody who has interacted with that on a small town community scale versus somebody who's interacted it on a large in a large city or things like that. So really our main focus is bringing people together and creating those connections and um, interactions between people that have had different lived experiences because that can be really hard. And that's one of the greatest values of being at, uni at this university is the diversity that's here. And we really want to exemplify that. It, it may be uh, uh, interesting to think about it. There is this um, horizontality to it that you can bring people from more or less similar experiences across the world to speak with you. The other, in the other axis, you have faculty and students, but maybe we cannot go a little bit further. I mean, can we bring, for example, is this an opportunity for also for some high school students? Is this an opportunity for people in different groups, you know, to be part of that group now that we're breaking the walls of the traditional classroom and that for me is, uh, um, I mean, the format that you created has such a rich potential because of that. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Luis. I need to send you and Jim Oliver out. So Jim, I don't know if you want to make a comment, but you're needed elsewhere, so. Wait. My computer's acting up as well as everything else going on. No, I appreciate the presentation. I, I do like the idea of a, a flat course that pr professors aren't just talking at you. It's a, that's a good idea. And uh, I do have to duck out just like uh, Dean Rico Gavier. So good Thank job, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just while we have you here and Louise, the plan is that um, the group of jurors between now and five is thinking and writing and whatever. At five, we'll open like one Zoom link um, for those of you who want to come and give me some feedback or some things. And then tomorrow at noon for all of you teams, I will be online to give you feedback and we'll let you know who's the winning team. Um, unless today at five, we can make it so quick that uh, we can give a pre-warning so that we know that one, uh, one or two representatives of your team can be available here in the Student Innovation Center at 2 p.m. Okay. I wanna do one thing before I leave and that is to thank everybody that came to the presentations. You know, we have a lot of people that went, you know, it's with us that came in the, over the weekend or now are coming because they're interested in the topic of the students. So thank you so much. And also to tell them, we will welcome your feedback, you know, around this project. So please send something to Anna, put it in the chat. You know where I have to find me also, or you know how to find uh, Jane or Cameron. Send us some feedback. You know, as I said, this afternoon we have a really difficult task thinking about uh, uh, you know all the all the rich presentation that we had today. Okay, thank you so much to all of you, and I'll see you. I'll see you later. Bye. <laughs> thank you, Louise. But I wanted to give also floor to Team Five to have some comments. And Jordan, thank you so much for putting. Do you want to say something out loud? Because you're talking about similar classes at School of Education. Oh, yeah, sure, definitely. I was just saying when you're thinking about that model of how you know the conversations are more based in actual conversation, right? Also, the class lesson is more based in conversation, and also that the the topics and things that come up in the choices in that pedagogy. Um, are coming from students in those dot courses, we do that a little bit. It may not be the full class, um, but at some portion within the semester, at some point the faculty stops teaching and then we're responsible for learning the content and delivering that to each other. And the faculty is present as a support. So yeah, right, if you're pulling this idea off, I, I think those are folks that you could go to in the early space of training the students or working with the students who are helping implement it, right? To, get their minds around how do we how do we do this um, to help that support that student leader and then also the faculty who that may not be their typical way of uh, teaching right um, helping them in that way so I think this is a cool idea. I'm muted Diana not to put you on the spotlight but I know that you had some ideas of this we talked about like things made by students for students so you want to give us some comments from your office. 
I would just like to take this opportunity to say that um, as a university, we know the importance of listening to students and we appreciate you putting yourselves out there today and letting us hear what's been on your mind and what innovative ideas you have to help us all do better and be better together. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Any last questions or comments about our flat? I want to do it. Okay, I'm going to put this proposal on the Academic Affairs Council and we're going to do it in the winter summer. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, any comments, last comments in general? I think the baston now lies on you, Cameron, as the other dean of the charrette. I don't know if you want to close it. It's three to three. So we need to wrap it up and somehow, yeah, say sure. thank you to all these delicious minds. Well, I think Louise already, you know, did a lot of the thank yous and I'll just reiterate the thank yous. But, you know, one of the observations I made earlier, which actually came into more clear focus today, as I've seen the teams develop, is that uh, while this sounds like a, 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 just a nice comment, it's a real meaningful comment that each of these teams kind of mutually modify one another. I could imagine how the class would be complemented by the storytelling or the storytelling by, well, the mental health care. I mean, and then the, the, the breakout space. I mean, you know, every single one of these has a way that it modifies and benefits the other. And, uh, and, and the, the complement inside of that is how uh, they are each unique and powerful and they stand alone. It isn't like you all pursued the same idea and it's a matter of whether it was uh, blue or red and we like the color better to decide, uh, you know, this is really going to be a challenge because they each have a thrust in an area that is, is, is needed, frankly. Uh, I think that there's, you know, each of these areas uh, need some attention, uh, you know, for us, to be a leader and maintain our our presence as a wonderful institution and you know the other thing is is that uh, you know we do not have enough interfaces like this with students because the, there are brilliant ideas and you're sharing them today uh, and and the teamwork that was done in a relatively short period of time can push us uh, it doesn't always have to be a process that takes you know weeks or months or even years uh, we've learned that in, in the rapid changes we've had to make in the last year, but you know, your rapid process to envision ideas help stimulate us in return and give us that wonderful uh, give take uh, to all the parties involved in this conversation. So I want to, on behalf of everyone, I guess I get to be acting on behalf of everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your energy, your creativity and your passion. Goodbye. Oh, you're muted. Jane, do you want to say some last words? Because we were in their space minds all the time. Um, no, I, I just wrote in the comments that I thought this was fantastic work. You know, we started out with that challenge of what is a learning place and, and how do we think about places of knowledge and placing knowledge. And I just, I think the teams took this and ran with it. I'm, I'm really just so impressed how every team lifted up a gap uh, every team identified a continuity. Every team challenged us towards transformation. Um, so really, really nice work at, at a time that I know is stressful in the semester. Forget COVID, right? Like, I don't even know. Um, that's just life now. So so really excellent work. And I'm, I'm honored to have had the chance to talk to you all in your development and, and to hear your work today. Same here. But you know, if we were in the same space, I would hug you all. Uh, I do want to say one last comment because Louise asked us to reach out to Anne-Marie Van Zenden, so our Associate Provost for Academic Affairs. And she wrote this morning to actually have access to your um, recordings. And myself or Louise are gonna have a session with her to present some of the things that you have here, which I think it's a brilliant achievement. Um, so I'm quite happy with that one. So I'll, I'll be in contact with you if we need a little bit more. I think some of you already gave your presentations to Rachel. If you haven't done so, I would be very grateful if you can uh, send your things our way. And any questions that you have, you can write to me or Rachel. 